Coming up on Network Africa, disqualified Côte d'Ivoire opposition candidate Guillaume Soro calls for election boycott. South Africa, which had one of the world's earliest and strictest lockdowns, announces further easing of lockdown restrictions to level one. Plus, over 200 prisoners still on the loose after escaping from Singila Prison in northeast Uganda. Thank you for joining us on the program today. I'm Layo Adegoke. We begin in Côte d'Ivoire, where former Prime Minister Guillaume Soro is calling on all opposition to unite against President Alassane Ouattara and stop him from winning a third term in upcoming elections. Guillaume Soro, who is in exile in France and was convicted this year in absentia for embezzlement, said the October 31st polls represent a civilian coup d'etat because the constitution states that leaders cannot rule for more than two terms. President Ouattara, who has been sworn in since 2010, insists that a change in the constitution in 2016 reset his term and that allows him to run again. But his decision has political observers worried about the threat to democracy in the country. A disputed election in 2010 led to a brief civil war that killed over 3,000 people. Earlier this week, the Constitutional Council whittled down an initial list of 44 presidential candidates to just four. Mr. Watara was approved, but it ruled out former President Laurent Gbagbo, who was acquitted by the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity charges last year, and also Guillaume Soro. Meanwhile, Côte d'Ivoire says it will not recognize Tuesday's ruling by the African Court on Human and People's Rights that allowed former Prime Minister Guillaume Soro to run in next month's elections. Government spokesperson C.D. Tiamoko Toure said the authorities will only recognize a decision by the country's constitutional court, which has already banned Mr. Soro from the elections because of a previous conviction. The country also banned former President Laurent Gbagbo from the elections on similar grounds. There have been protests over President Alassane Ouattara's decision to run for a third term after his preferred successor died in July. Well, Libyan Prime Minister Fayez al-Saraj says he intends to hand over power to the next executive authority by the end of October. He is currently the head of the internationally recognized government in Tripoli, and there has been a renewed drive by the international community for a new political solution for Libya, with talks taking place in several countries around the world. In a televised address on Wednesday night, Mr. Seraj called on the Dialogue Committee to work quickly on forming a new executive authority in order to guarantee a peaceful transition of power. He says he sincerely intends to hand over his duties to the next executive authority by the end of October at the latest. Renowned human rights lawyer George Bezos has been laid to rest in an official funeral on Thursday in Johannesburg. His coffin was draped in the South African flag and wheeled into a Greek church by military pall bearers. Mr. Bezos passed away at the age of 92 from natural causes at his home last week. During his eulogy, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa referred to Bezos as a great tree that had fallen and said that the late human rights lawyer was a champion whose advocacy work during the apartheid era helped launch the country's democracy. A great tree has fallen. A tree that gave shade to the patriots that founded our great nation and sheltered the poor, the marginalized, and the vulnerable.
Welcome to our coronavirus coverage. Mixed reactions have trailed South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa's Wednesday night speech to the nation on the movement to COVID alert level one. While some lauded government for lifting more of the lockdown restrictions come midnight on Sunday, September 20th, there are those who think the relaxation may be too soon. Some land borders and the nation's airspace will reopen for movement with strict conditions from the 1st of October. The move to alert level one will take effect from midnight on the Sunday, nation expected this the 20th and the president delivered. But reactions are still mixed on the streets. I am happy. Because if we can just practice, you know, the the, 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 the the social distancing and the protection, the health, you know, uh, the health uh, uh, practices, I think this corona we can combat it. I'm against us going to level one because I feel like it's too soon and they haven't said anything about finding a cue. So now going to level one, opening borders is not a good thing because now South Africans will start to relax, continue drinking, traveling, not being really careful. This thing is in two way. Um, remember that our economy is, is, is going down. Yes, yeah, so we definitely need to be running up and running. But at the same time, the question is, are we really safe from the COVID-19? Is it going to be maintainable? Yeah, we are happy when he's announcing that uh, he's opening up the borders because uh, we've been waiting for this for quite some time. We as the tech industry we are working mainly about people coming from other countries are the ones that are making our money. Off-site alcohol sale is now permitted for five days instead of four a maximum of 250 people indoors and 500 people outdoors can now gather, provided all anti-COVID protocol is observed. The curfew has been reviewed to midnight to 4 a.m. The list is longer, but it will all come into effect on Monday, the 21st of September, while limited international flights will resume on the 1st of October. I think um, the president gave us all good news. I think we have been starting to have um, COVID withdrawal symptoms. So understanding that would have a lot more freedom, understanding that would now be able to attend events, um, though with limited uh, numbers in the venues, um, understanding that uh, there is going to be a heavy focus on revitalizing the economy, uh, and that will now be able to spend more time with friends and family was definitely something that the country was looking forward to and that was um, boosting morale for the country. I think we'll start to see some of that positive sentiment starting to trickle across into the economy. While many applaud the government on some reviewed restrictions, the retention of the ban on live sports spectators is not going down well with affected parties. More details of lockdown level one regulations are expected from the relevant ministers in the National COVID Command Council, especially the list of countries to and from which flights will be restricted. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television News. Back here in Nigeria, the government of Borno State has kicked off plans to evacuate 126,000 Nigerian citizens taking refuge in Niger Republic. The Borno State Governor, Babagana Zulum, has been discussing with authorities on seamless ways to achieve this mission. The refugees sacked from their hometown in northern Borno journeyed westward to Differ, a border town in Niger. <laughs> Attached houses, temporary shelters in an open space in a foreign country. How temporary is six years? That's how long this displaced Nigerians have lived in Difa province of the Niger Republic. Sacked by Boko Haram from Malamfatori town of Abandam local government area, 
They are the lucky ones alive to tell their stories. With no source of livelihood, it's survival of the fittest in this refugee camp set up by the government of Niger. To be honest, we want to go back 100%. If today or tomorrow, he returns with at least asking for the names of those who want to go back. Honestly, we want to go back. Because living on charity every day is not sustainable. I have lived here for about six years now. I was in Kaula before I came here. They received us well. We thank God. They welcomed us. They gave us food and shelter. We are here. My children are there doing menial jobs in the market. Sometimes they follow transporters on their marketing trips, and we feed from what they make. This particular day, these Borno indigents have risen to chair. Governor Babagana Zulum is visiting. The news had filtered in about plans to return the refugees home. Zulum's visit is a return leg of different governor's visit last month. The government of Niger believes the refugees are better off back home in Nigeria for those willing to return. The men, the women and children are eager to hear the outcome of the meeting between the two governors. Zulum speaks in the native language. Zulum assures them in their native language of the liberation of their village. This revelation leaves everyone excited. We have seen their situation. God willing, the federal government under the leadership of President Buhari, government of Borno State, Ministry of Humanitarian and Affairs, as well as the Federal Refugee Commission, will do everything possible to ensure return of displaced communities to their hometowns in a, in a dignified manner. A total of 126,000 people are currently in the refugee camp waiting to be evacuated. They look forward to a new life in their ancestral homes where they can hopefully sleep with two eyes closed. Well, despite a new government in Burundi, there has been no progress in improving human rights. That's according to a UN Commission of Inquiry into alleged human rights violations. UN investigators say there had been hope for change when President Evariste Ndayishimiye replaced Pierre Nkuruziza in June. But so far, those hopes have not been realized. They have just completed their latest report covering May 2019 to May 2020, the UN's fourth into Burundi, which suggests that serious violations had continued unabated. When the venture Sinabaye was 20 years old at the time of the 1972 massacre in his home district of Gikuzi in Burundi's southern city of Makamba, his younger brother was among the people taken to the courthouse and shot dead by security forces. Some did not die immediately. The execution has shot them by bringing another group and stacking the corpses. They will bring more group of people, shooting at them, and the corpses were stacked on each other until they perished. A UN report released on the 17th of September says despite a change of government, impunity and numerous rights abuses are still widespread in Burundi and many of them are connected to elections held in May. The new president, retired General Everest Ndaishime, took power in June. President Ndaishime's speech at his inauguration had hinted that he hoped to make a break from the abuses committed under his predecessor, a former leader of a Hutu militia who took power in 1995 following a 12-year civil war. But the report notes that he has promoted high-ranking military officers involved in human rights abuses appointed some military officers to governorships previously held by civilians and included two men in his cabinet who are under sanctions for rights violations. Burundi has the same ethnic makeup as neighboring Rwanda, whose 1994 genocide by Hutu militia killed around 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus. The country has also suffered periodic bouts of ethnic violence and established a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to recover the remains of victims. But well, the Commission's mandate ended in 2018, ignoring the most recent episodes of political violence. Still ahead on Network Africa. Thousands of people still battling with flooding in South Sudan with businesses and homes destroyed. Please stay with us.
Welcome back to the program. Officials in Uganda say seven out of 219 prisoners who escaped from a jail in northeastern Uganda have been recaptured. Some of the fugitives reportedly took off their distinctive yellow prison uniforms and fled naked into the hills to avoid detection. The escapees are thought to be trying to use mountain routes to cross the border into Kenya. An army spokesperson said the inmates killed a soldier after the broke out of the facility in Moroto on Wednesday. Now a manhunt is ongoing by the army and prison officials to find about 200 men who reportedly made off with 15 guns and ammunition. The prison facility, which usually has a population of more than 600 inmates, is built on the foothills of Mount Moroto on the edge of the town. And now the site is under lockdown as investigations into how the jailbreak happened begins. On Monday, September 21st, the world's biggest climate summit begins in New York with a focus on how to rebuild after the COVID-19 pandemic. Uganda is slowly increasing its tree cover after years of devastation, government and UN officials say. Now they're drawing on an innovative strategy involving foreign logging companies to protect forests that function as carbon sinks and provide homes to endangered mountain gorillas, leopards and rare birds. For decades, farmers hungry for land and families needing firewood whittled away at Uganda's forest, home to endangered gorillas, elephants and chimpanzees. Now the decline has not only stopped but reversed, thanks to a policy encouraging private tree plantations as buffers next to protected forests. We are still a rain-fed agricultural economy. So if you don't have health forests that can help you form the needed rain to support agriculture, then you will have to invest heavily into the irrigation, which still would as well suffer. The other factor is that focusing on rehabilitating these forests would still uh, support the energy sector. These forests are catchments for all of these rivers and lakes, and that's where we are generating power from these rivers. So, it is a very critical resource that must be focused on critically and therefore supported so that other dependent sectors can also flourish. According to the National Forestry Authority, between 1990 and 2015, Uganda's forest cover plummeted from 24% of its area to 9%. It's now up to 12.5%. The companies are licensed to plant trees from timber in unplanted parts of government-owned forest reserves, the program began 15 years ago, but the impact unfolded slowly. It takes at least seven years for a seedling to grow tall enough to count as forest cover. So far, the NFA has licensed 4,000 private investors, including Britain's new forest company and Germany's Global Woods. Nearly half of 200,000 hectares allocated for the initiative have been planted. Several incentives were thought about, including uh, putting aside land in central forest reserves for uh, afforestation and also making available free seedlings to communities and every individual in the country to be able to plant. Uganda's maximum average annual temperature increased an estimated 0.6 to 0.9 degrees Celsius between 1951 to 2010, predicting an increase of around 2 degrees Celsius over the next 50 years. The NFA says it wants to replenish forest cover back to 24% of Uganda's landmass by 2040. The UN mission in South Sudan says heavy flooding has affected 500,000 people in the central region, with the states of Lakes and Jongle being the worst affected. The head of the mission, David Scherer, told the UN Security Council on Wednesday that heavy rainfall and flooding of the River Nile had devastated parts of the country, as humanitarians are working hard to help people living without shelter, food, water and sanitation in the middle of the raining season. He adds that there had been an upturn in conflict from the splintering of armed groups and the situation seems to have calmed down, but Mr. Sherris says tensions remain high and efforts must be made to stop a resurgence. 
All Senegal's leading graffiti artists are deploying their crafts to raise awareness about the coronavirus. The artists belong to a collective called RBS Crew, created in 2012 with the goal of making its message ring out like what they describe as blasts of gunfire to touch the entire public. In Senegal's seaside capital, Dakar, Graffiti is everywhere, splashed in brilliant colors on houses and highway overpasses, whether it celebrates local heroes demanding better government services and condemning former colonial master France's influence. Now, leading graffiti artists are deploying their craft to raise awareness about the coronavirus. Outside one high school, Six artists joined forces over the course of eight and a half hours to paint a more than 10 meter long mural showing a hand dispensing sanitizer and an elderly religious leader wearing a surgical mask along with his flowing robes. Residents say they find it informative, especially for people who do not have access to road and television broadcasts. Oui, je trouve ça très intéressant. Yes, I find this interesting as long as it contributes to making people aware. There are all the images needed to show the precautions that need to be taken. I find that interesting. If people can get inspired by this, it's very interesting. The media, radio and television are good, but these visuals are important, I think. As Senegalese, we have a duty a responsibility to raise awareness amongst the population, especially as the majority is illiterate. They did not go to the French school. So as artists, we communicate through visuals with images they understand better. Senegal has one of the highest levels of infection in West Africa. Experts say larger outbreak could strain scarce health resources. All the murals painted around Dakar by the collective show people washing their hands with soap and water and sneezing into their elbows. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adegoke.